Hello and welcome to this week's Catholic Herald podcast where we discuss what's really happening in the Catholic Church. I'm Madeline Sheehan, the Associate Editor, and today I'm joined by Elizabeth Scalia, Editor-in-Chief of the English edition of Alatea.org. Elizabeth asks this week if miracles are making a comeback. Elizabeth, in your piece, you, you point out that we live in a time which is increasingly secular and scientific, so perhaps not so compatible with uh, the idea of miracles. But I guess, first of all, I wondered how you would explain to the average person in the street what a miracle is, what the church understands by the term miracle. You know, that's a really good question. And, and off the top of my head, you know, you ask me what a miracle is, I will say, golly, I don't know. And and the reason I don't know is because what a miracle is, is our own reality imbued with mystery that is beyond our understanding. It's tinged with a, a kind of touch of wonder. Um, so when you ask me what a miracle is, obviously I can see in a very broad sense, um, if 70,000 people are standing in a muddy field in Fatima and the sun begins to spin and everything becomes dry, um, okay, that's a miracle. We can all kind of say, yeah, okay, that's kind of a miracle. But but miracles uh, exist in our lives in other ways, in really small ways, and ways that simply can't be explained. So you have a situation like um, Lourdes, you know, the, the beautiful <laughs> spring at Lourdes where people go and thousands upon thousands of people have uh, gone into the springs at Lourdes seeking healing, um, and of all of those thousands, only I think 69 have actually been uh, credited by the church as miracles, miraculous healings. Now, the church is very careful about what it calls a miracle because, let's face it, we humans, we like wonder, we like awe, um, we like to call things miracles. You know, Hey, I found a parking space You know, while I was Christmas mm-hmm. shopping. It was a miracle. <laughs> you know, it's not really a, a miracle. I don't think. Um, but, but when you come to something like Lourdes, and you have these 69 uh, documented cases of miraculous healings that cannot be explained any other way, not through anything that we know of science, that's another kind of miracle. And yet, thousands of people still keep coming to Lourdes. They don't say, well, you know, boo on that. Thousands of people have gone and only 69 have been healed. I'm not going to bother going to Lourdes. No, they go to Lourdes anyway. And they come back. And they, if you've ever talked to somebody who's gone to Lourdes and has come back physically in the same condition, they will tell you, I, w- I had a healing while I was at Lourdes. And you'll say, no, no, you still, you're still you know, limping around with the cane and you look terrible. And they're like, no, 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 I had an interior healing. Um, and so they'll call that a miracle, but it's certainly not something that the church would credit as a miracle. And then you have other small uh, things, daily events in our lives where we make a prayer and it seems like the prayer has been heard and something inconceivable happens before us. It's a miracle too. But but in terms of being able to describe, you know, what is a miracle, you, you can either run with the, cat, the catechism and say it's everything the church says and only that, or you can accept the fact that there are miracles all around us all the time. So can you, um, so from what you're saying, uh, you might say quite simply, you know, a miracle is an answer to prayer. But as you say, we have um, small requests and huge requests. Um, And also you mentioned your piece uh, on the larger scale, uh, this incident in Poland, which took place about three years ago. Could you tell us a bit more about that, Elizabeth? Yeah, this was one of those surprising little stories that um, barely got uh, any notice at all, and I happened to see it only because I was at a news feed at 3 o'clock in the morning because I I am insomniac. And um, I, I saw this little thing pass through, you know, a Eucharistic miracle in Poland, and uh, nobody was reporting on it. And, and this is really kind of an amazing miracle, and what we will call one. Um, because the bishop and the church have said, yes, this is something we cannot explain. Apparently, uh, during communion, there was a situation where uh, a a piece of of the Holy Eucharist, a piece of the communion wafer was um, abused in a way and uh, left behind, and so someone, a priest, picked it up and put it in the ablution cup where, uh, you know, such things are, are put if no one consumes the Eucharist. They'll put it in this cup, and it will slowly dissolve in the water, and, and then the water is, of course, returned to the earth. Um, in this particular case, something red seemed to be growing on on the host, and, and it seemed very um, very much like blood and very much like flesh, 
Now, sometimes this will happen, and it's just a red bacteria. Um, in fact, we had the situation pretty recently in the United States where people in Utah thought they had a Eucharistic miracle, and really they just had bacteria on the host and it mm. formed on it. Once they tested it, they realized what had happened. But in this case, um, the Holy Eucharist was taken for lab testing, and what was discovered was that this, uh, what had seemed to be uh, a piece of bread and that we as Catholics believe is, is transformed in transubstantiation within the Mass, um, actually uh, gave evidence of being um, consistent with striated cardiac muscle, species human, uh, and bearing, most interestingly, uh, bearing the cellular alterations that often appear as evidence of torture in medical postmortems. In other words, this was a piece of heart tissue, striated mm -hmm. heart tissue, um, and it was bearing the, the cellular evidence that generally appears when um, a, a medical examiner is looking at a heart and seeing uh, this person was tortured, this person was put through hell. Uh, before he died, and we know this because of the condition of certain cellular um, happenings within this tissue. Uh, that's really remarkable because then we're being told this is the heart muscle, the heart tissue of a man who we know was tortured before he died, and it's the same man, same God that we say we are consuming within the Holy Eucharist. So that's, you know, that's a miracle. <laughs> you know, that's another explanation of a miracle. Absolutely fascinating and you know you write in your article as well that you cite a study a 2010 Pew study um, saying that uh, I believe 78 percent of young adults age 18 to 29 admitted uh, that they believe in miracles and then yeah. you also say that they, millennials believe in life after death and heaven and hell too which really really surprised me um, why do you think that so many um, of them do believe in in the miraculous. Is it possibly that they want to believe in the miraculous? Is it is it comforting in some way? I think that's part of it. I think as human beings, we always want to have hope. We always want to think that you know someone's looking out for me. Um, mm. And I also think that you know there's there's that sense that because we're human, we we want to be awestruck by something. But I think too, it's it's perhaps based on simple observation in their own lives. I mean, if you really are paying attention to your life, you, you're going to notice that there are times when something that doesn't seem like it should be happening is, in fact, happening. Um, you know, I'll give you a small example. The, the one story that always uh, remains with me, if you know uh, Corey Ten Boom's uh, book, The Hiding Place, I do, uh, yeah. She's a Protestant brilliant. evangelist who she and her sister were in a concentration camp in Robbinsbrook uh, mm -hmm. during the Second World War. And she tells a story about how they were put into a barracks, and it was a filthy, disgusting barracks that was absolutely flea-ridden and, and lice-ridden and terrible. And um, Corey was complaining about it because that's the sort of person she was. And her sister Betsy was saying, no, no, we must give thanks in all circumstances. So I want you to join me right now in a prayer of thanksgiving. And she's like, you're out of your mind. I am not going to give thanks for this. Mm -hmm. And uh, nevertheless, she, counted, she, she surrendered to Betsy's will. And they knelt down and prayed. And, and they thanked God for this horrible, terrible flea and tick and lice-ridden barracks uh, because at least they were together. And and so, you know, if that's where they had to be, then thank you, God, this is where we are. Well, it turned out um, because that place was so disgusting, even the, garden, the guards would not enter it. And so this barracks became a very free place. It became a place where they could minister to people, where they could discuss, you know, scripture and, and prayer, and they could help people uh, survive by feeding their spirits in a way that their bodies, you know, certainly couldn't be nourished. Um, and that's kind of miraculous when you think about everything that has to fall into place for that to happen. Uh, when we say something is providential, we're saying it's kind of miraculous. And I wonder, I think the Catholics are in many ways moving back towards a sort of popular piety, you know, rosary beads, Eucharistic processions, novenas, and of course, a belief and an embracing of the miraculous. And I kind of wonder why why this is the case. Like you see young Catholics praying the rosary now in a way that you didn't see that so much when even I was growing up. And I just wonder whether in this sort of increasingly secular 
age, we're kind of clinging to signs and symbols of our Catholic identity in a way that perhaps we weren't before. And a belief in the miraculous is a very Catholic uh, marker. Well, you know, I think we're living in an age where we're very distracted. We have social media. We have, you know, our faces and our phones constantly. The email never stops coming in. And everything seems very um, disposable. It seems like, you know, we read something and, and 30 seconds later we've forgotten it. We watch a video and 30 seconds later we've forgotten it. And we get the sense that we are disposable as well, um, mm-hmm. particularly, you know, with, with a, a mindset of abortion and euthanasia and what have you. And yet what God tells us over and over again is that we are not disposable. Catholics say we do not throw people away. And I, I wonder, I, I can't say it for sure, but I wonder if it's not possible that perhaps a, a re-embrasure of these devotions, a re-embrasure of, of looking at what is eternal, isn't tied up with that, um, with our sense that we, we want to hear that we're not mm-hmm. disposable. We want to hear that we're loved into being. We want to hear, as Pope, uh, Pope Benedict wrote back when he was Joseph Retzinger in uh, Principles of Catholic Theology, um, he wrote that the essential thing is that the human being must hear before anything else can happen, before faith can even begin, the human being must hear, it is good that you exist. Mm-hmm. And if you're not getting that message anywhere else, if you're being told in the culture you're disposable, you're not important, you're just a cog in the wheel, you're just a consumer of this product, then somewhere they're going to reach out for that message to hear, it is good that you exist. And where do they hear that? They hear that in the life of faith. They hear that in the creator who loved them into being. So I wonder, you know, if that doesn't have, if that doesn't have a piece of it. You know, the, the, the whole sense of, of needing to hope and needing to believe in something means we need to also believe and hope in miracles. Well, if you'd like to read Elizabeth's brilliant article in full, the Catholic Herald is out and priced at £2, or why not subscribe to our online app and read the magazine every week from the comfort of your phone or tablet Visit catholicherald.co.uk for more information. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us today. It's lovely talking to you. Thank you, Madeline.